Let's see here. Yeah, so I thought it'd be good to talk about, or this is something that Subutai had sort of uh, ran by me a while ago, some um, papers where they apply self-attention to vision. So self-attention is this pretty popular technique, um, and LNLP are, is increasingly popular. Um, and sort of uh, there have been recent papers that said, okay, well, you know, applied well to NLP, and so can we apply it well to vision? So this I thought could be a good time to one, go over this application of vision, um, to also uh, actually just talk about self-attention. I think we've had it presented in different forms in the past, but we never actually sort of gotten down into some of the nitty gritties of what attention self-attention looks like. Um, let's see, how do I go next? Okay. Yeah, so yeah, so I thought I'd reiterate on self-attention once again, we talked about it, kind of go into the details a little bit more, also talk about it in the context of context. So in the dendrite work that we're sort of doing, um, you know, we're thinking a lot about uh, making context informed representations. As I interpret it, uh, self-attention is sort of, you know, the machine learning community's way of, or one way the machine learning community sort of deals with uh, context, in particular um, context, you know, within very long uh, sentences. <clears throat> um, and then there's also some kind of interesting, which is just sort of like why self-attention is just so very popular these days and sort of why it's getting <clears throat> the results that it's getting. And it's somewhat uh, just a uh, reiteration of the just build a bigger mentality of machine learning. You know, you scale up the model, you throw more data at it, um, and things just sort of, you know, seem to work better, you know, at least on the benchmarks. So I'll kind of like sort of circle back to this and sort of just pose a question of the group. Um, so yeah, as I said, self-attention has been applied in NLP. This is like the GPT-2 and GPT-3 uh, models that just sort of uh, have just done very well in benchmarks and sort of have, you know, just sort of uh, very impressive results, um, impressive demos online. Um, and sort of the main thing that it's doing uh, is it sort of uh, help, it's helping establish long range dependencies in text. So you can kind of think in, uh, you know, processing sequences, sort of how do you preserve the information of, of previous inputs? Um, and that can kind of be difficult with an RNN if you only are sort of dealing with one hidden state at a time. And so someone came along and said, instead of, uh, um, instead of processing one word at a time, what if you just do every word at the same time? And so that kind of gets to the difference between an RNN and, and, a, uh, and a self attention network. So this is just an overview and I'll kind of describe the architecture, but so in an RNN, you can kind of think of it as you're baking the understanding of the previous words into the, just the one that you're processing. So this also sort of happens in the uh, temporal memory algorithm where you're going to create a context informed representation of your current input uh, given the ones from previous. Um, but you only sort of get one you know, hidden state uh, in a sense uh, to sort of process um, and sort of to inform the representation for your current word. Uh, in contrast, in self-attention, you bake the understanding of any relevant word into the one that you're processing, and then you do that for every single word. Um, so here's sort of like an example of that. So there's a sentence. Michelangelo, that, when you say you do that for every word, every word that you're currently processing or every word that is the context, like you're going through previous, many previous contexts, or you're saying? You do that for, uh, I mean, every word in the sentence, like you're going to look around, you're going to say, you're going to go to this first word, the, and you're going to say, I have a representation for the, but how do I also incorporate representations of all the other words in the sentence? And then you're going to go to the word animal and you say, I have a representation for animal, but how do I incorporate representations for every other word in the sentence and so on and so on. So when you say the, again, I'm trying the last thing you said and do that for every word, you're referring to the words on the left, like every word in the sentence you're processing or, or all the history words. Uh, what is every referring to there? I'm sorry. It's, it's a, it's every word would be every word in the sentence that you're currently processing. Okay. So that's like the words on the left. You're going to, as you go down one at a time. You're going to exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, uh, just a quick, uh, it's a little worse than that. It's not just if you have n words that you're processing, it's every word in the context of every other word. So there's n squared yeah. possible contexts. So it's very uh -huh. brute force. Uh -huh. It is very brute force, yeah. That's so all I, I, yeah. I state with the word the, and then I go down to all the previous words, and then I do animal, and I do all the previous words, and I do didn't, and do all the previous. Is that what you're saying? Not necessarily yeah. all the previous words, but every other word in the sentence. So it didn't, you're going to go through the animal uh, and all these. Uh, yeah, you're I, just showing, this figure just shows one, one set of comparisons, but 
all the words on the right are being compared to all the words on the left. Oh, even past and pro past and future. Past and future, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's not true for all transformers, right? Uh, it's very oh, common. Yeah. A lot of papers that they freeze at the model. They set it in such a way that you can only look at past, and not the future. So I think that's for the prediction part. But on the left hand, uh, for the the one where actually, yeah, oh, but, I guess you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the prediction has to match the the training. The prediction part. part is only the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. So yeah, so in this example, you have it, and then you have some representation for it, and you're going to basically combine that represent, or I should say, you have representations for every word in the sentence, and then you're sort of going to combine them in some intelligent way um, to sort of form one representation for it. So it sort of makes sense to sort to preserve a lot of the animal because uh, it is um, is uh, is or what is it? Um, it is identifying the animal. So, yeah, but how do you know that, right? That's the question. Oh, you learn that. So that's like um, that's like the uh, the trick of uh, of transformers is to sort of um, you basically learn these connections on the fly, or I should say you basically identify these connections on the fly, um, and you sort of learn how you're going to identify those connections. Um, and, and but if I just would look at the one word it uh, and do one pass to all the other words, I wouldn't know what it refers to. So. Um, how do, what's the basic mechanism by which they decide that the animal is more important than you know, because and, and cross and things like that? Essentially, what it, would, what it boils down to is you're going to form a representation for it, and you're going to form a representation for the an animal. And then you're going to look essentially how similar those two things are. Um, and then the more similar they are, then the more you're going to uh, use the animal in your final representation. So, so in this case, if I just had this one sentence, I wouldn't have enough knowledge to know that, right? So that when you say you form a representation, that must be a representation that's formed over many, many different sentences, right? Well, I think there's two different things. One is each word has a representation, which is like an encoding. Uh, yeah. So that's that you know we can that's done uh, you know separately, but then um, then it learns in a brute force way that if you have animal here and you have these kinds of words near you and you have an animal-like word in the middle, what other parts might you want to pay attention to? And that's learned for every possible word in every possible context. And that's why, you know, that's why you need these, you know, billions of word yeah, uh, sentences yeah, okay. as training. Yeah. And in the transformers model, what's learned there are the queries and keys. I think Michael is going to talk about it. I don't know if you remember. So the eat is going to be, uh, so you're going to use the query for the word eat, and you're going to match against the key for uh, each one of the other words on the left side. Or I don't know. I don't know how the word query and key is, but one of either. But you're going to try to match one with the other and see where it fits. So it's going to learn uh, those weights that uh, they're going to tell you, you know, eat fits with animals. So it's probably referring to that word. So I'm going to attribute a high value to that combination. I guess I'm still struggling a little bit understanding how it determines that. I mean, it's obvious to us, but, but I mean, see what I said, there's two things I think. One is that maybe the, the base encoding for it and the animal have some sort of pre-learned similarity. And then, but then in one sentence like this, you wouldn't be able to figure this out. So somehow you're going to have to do this over many, many different sentences to figure out, I don't understand how, that it is referring to the animal here, not to the word cross. Um, um, I mean, it's just not, you can't, it, in a single sentence, there's no way of knowing that, right? Yeah, so the basic task is to predict the next word. And so no. it's trained, um, you know, like I said, on bil millions, yeah. hundreds of millions of sentences, and it's always trying to predict the next word. And it figures out, based on the word encoding, what patterns of nearby things you need to incorporate in order to correctly predict the God. next word. So it says, okay, I had a prediction of the next word, or, and um, what you know, and somehow I slowly filter the you know backprop or something. Get down to saying, okay, the, the I should reinforce the animal as the con connection there because that's the best predictor. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and just um, to get the scale of this, you know, we're, we're I guess there's like 10, 15 words shown here, but in GPT three, there's it looks at two thousand words. Yes. Yeah. Two thousand forty-eight. So it's huge. Somebody's cutting something with their microphone. 
<laughs> cooking or something. Uh, yeah, okay, got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so hopefully, I wonder if the um, showing the architecture will, uh, I guess, sort of help things as well. Is it which self-attention just refer to that process by which you're making this prediction and then figuring out what the what the uh, the right um, predictive components are? Is that is that what self-attention refers to? I guess I don't understand what it means making the making a prediction. Um, well, I'm going on what Supertai said. The whole the whole learning process here is trying to predict the next word in the sentence and using that prediction as the as the teacher to figure out what would be the best previous and forward-looking components that. Uh, are are related to that. I best make that prediction. I'm just asking. So that given if that given what Subutai said, is that the basic definition of a self attention in this case? Um, yeah, I think the self attention is uh, like um, Michael. I just said one way to do it is in a temporal way, and like the RNN where you're you keeping the context somehow in the representation, like we do in temporal memory. Uh, but self attention. I think it's just, it's all done in one feed forward way. Every possible pairwise thing is represented in this feed forward thing. So self-attention is like in one input pattern, it's attending to different parts of itself, <laughs> if that makes sense. Okay, all right, I see. So it's less, the, it's less the training paradigm or learning paradigm, it's more the result of um, the given a, given a sentence or 2000 words, whatever, uh, I learned to attend to some components of that um, of its own. The thing I'm trying to understand, I, I'm attending to the components of that. So it's, it's yeah, just and because it's all presented at once, it's yeah. sort of attending to itself. Whereas if you were to feed it in one one word at a time, then it's sort of, I guess, some temporal attention or whatever. I don't know. Got it. Got it. I think that's what self attention means. Does that mean there is no there is it, there isn't really a serial training paradigm here? I mean, there's could, no. Oh, there's a so, serial training paradigm, but the network is is a feed forward. Network. I mean, for example, I could I, I do all the words in the right here in parallel. I mean, I could do them in any order, right? It, you're, it doesn't matter. It, you're not taking advantage of the fact in the training method. It, we're not taking advantage of the fact. Um, we're not, you don't have to go through the words in order, right? You can do them all at once. Or you can do them backwards order as long as each word is compared to every other word. Is that, is you that can do it all at once, but the order does matter. So you have well, the order, produce. the order in which they're presented in the sentence matters, but not, it's not like we're, we have to train one word, then the next word, then the next word. You could train them all at once or in any order, is that right? And, and well, it's, it's, it is trained se serially because it's, uh, it's trained to predict the next word. So it'll first do just the, and it's supposed to predict animal, and then it does the animal, and it's mm. supposed to predict didn't, and so yeah. on. But well, I could try, I could just try to predict the word after street, and then I could try to predict the word after animal. I mean, it seems like that would work just as well. But yeah, I think that would work too. That, yeah, that's fine. It does. Yeah. I think that's actually the breakthrough of a transform is that uh, since you can parallelize, then you can scale to very large uh, models, and, and that's kind of what happened when we moved from our lens to transform. Oh, that's interesting. So basically, I, I could divide the concurrence into all these different words training on different machines and bring them back together again or something yeah. like that. Yeah, so you can parallelize across like- Which I couldn't do if I had to do them in, in sequential order. Yeah. Um, like our temporal memory has to be done in sequential order. You can't do it in any other order. Um, exactly, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Wait, is the output of the of the um, of a transformer is it one word at a time or is it one sentence at a time? It's just one word at a time. It's the whole context at a time, I think. What time of the output? Are you saying uh, the the output? I think is given everything up to the current word, and then it's supposed to predict the next word. Oh, okay. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, Oh yeah, so, so talking about the architecture, I wonder if it will, um, I guess, uh, sort of iron out some of the things we just talked about, but the way how I think is possibly reasonable to, possibly reasonable to talk about uh, self-attention is to make an analogy to a fully connected neural network, um, uh, except for two things. You're gonna generalize the inputs and you're gonna generalize the connections. Um, so it's sort of a, like a fully connected network in the sense that you know you're going to sort of um, uh, you're going to combine um, your representations for all of your inputs 
um, in a fully connected manner. So in this case, we have three to three, and you're going to uh, have a sort of uh, a weighted connections um, in um, uh, what is it? In sort of three different ways for nine nine weights total. Um, so this is just a different example. I just say the cat, etc., just because it's sort of easier to draw a diagram of a of a with three inputs and, and three outputs. Um, this red is now going to sort of kind of correspond to a new representation for rep for the. This red will correspond to new representation for cat, and then this red will correspond to new representation for just the rest of the sentence, um, or you know just this one word, etc. Um, so as I said, the first thing you're going to um, you're going to generalize your inputs, and so really all this is is just you're going to take your encoding um, and you're going to path it through a neural network. So this is why I say at the top it's using three neural networks in, in a way to, to make one neural network. Um, so these three will sort of combine to make one generalized uh, neural network. So this is the first one. You have a set of weights um, called uh, W V. These are going to output these quote unquote values. So you go from encodings to values. And this transformation is applied in the same exact way uh, for the same exact way for cat and same exact way for et cetera. So these weights are shared right here. So that sort of gives you these general uh, inputs. Um, and then now you're going to take linear combinations uh, of these of these vectors of these values. Um, so to generalize the connections, you kind of just start, uh, we'll start looking at uh, this for sort of first one. We're going to um, create a generalized representation for the, maybe you want to keep a little bit of the, you want to keep a good amount of cat in your representation. And maybe there's a little bit of information in the rest of it and the et cetera that you want to keep as well. So these values are going to be determined uh, on the fly. And we're going to use the other two uh, neural networks to decide that. So once again, you're going to work over your encodings. And you're going to pass it through two neural networks. One is going to be a query. Uh, neural network, this WQ, and that's sort of represented by the purple. And, and sort of once again, it's going to be uh, shared um, uh, among all your encodings. And then your WK uh, is your quote unquote, your keys that's represented in the orange. And so you're going to use the same set of weights, uh, WK uh, against the same set of weights for cat, same set of weights for et cetera. So once again, we're just working on this, on these first three uh, connections. And so now you're going to take the query of the, look at how similar it is with the key of the, and then decide essentially how much to keep. So the more similar they are, the more you're gonna keep, the less similar are, the less they're gonna keep. Um, and then you're gonna look at the query of cat, or sorry, the query of the, because we're just working on the, and then the key of cat, and you're gonna say how similar is the and cat. Um, and it'll be reasonable similar, so you keep about uh, a little bit more. And then finally, you look at, you know, once again, uh, query of the key of et cetera. And then you decide how much sort of how similar these two vectors are. And then uh, that's sort of how much you keep. So these three values are going to end up being your um, sort of deciding the linear combination that you take on the left. And then you repeat that same process very, uh, you know, similarly for cat and very similarly for et cetera to get your um, sort of decide all the connections that you will end up using. So does that make sense? What is it defining as uh, similar? Similar is, uh, in this case, I just mean like a dot product similar. So like uh, it's effectively like a, effectively like a cosine similarity. So the more in line the two vectors are, then the more similar they are. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and then you also have to normalize these values in some way to make sure they add up to one. Uh, but that's you can maybe consider that just a smaller detail. Um, for instance, this may output like one, five, and then three, and then you just out, you know, normalize it to 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.3 uh, in some manner. Oh, wait, I kind of missing. Where does the cosine similarity uh... isn't cosine? When you just consider, I mean, a dot product is analogous in a sense to cosine similarity, right? Oh, okay. The dot product means the query and the key, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah, the product, the the key. Similarity. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Hmm. Yeah, so that's the that's a general architecture. I don't know if this answers any of the questions that I did from before. Um, okay. When there's Q1, <coughs> Q1 and K1, 
Mm -hmm. um, it's just comparing against itself there. It would just compare against itself in, in a sense. Yeah. In this one. Okay. Yeah. Um, and when you go to do cat, it's also going to then it'd be Q2 and K2 uh, and sort of be comparing against itself. Um, I believe, what was Jeff's question? It had to do with um, how do you, I guess, decide what words are relevant to one another? I'm not really sure exactly what the original question was. Well, I think, I think it was answered. I was trying to understand um, just the basic way that, the, yeah, you know, just which, which the words forward pass you attend to. I think I, think I got it. But I don't understand this Q1 and K1 here, but it's our own. I don't think I need to. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, I guess just in summary, yeah, it's just using three neural networks to make to make one. You generalize the connections and you generalize um, the, the inputs. Um, and these are just sort of decide on the fly to determine um, how much is one relate, word related to another word. Um, and then you sort of take linear combinations to sort of preserve uh, the relevance of the important words. Okay, um, so this is, I guess, uh, the first point of you know sort of why this uh, works. Um, this is my possible explanation, um, as opposed to an RNN, which sort of uh, has this issue of um, keeping long range dependencies. Now all of a sudden you have tight links between things that may be related to one another as you create. Uh, I'll call them context informed representations. Um, I say tight links because you can relate, you know, the tenth word in the sentence directly to the first word in the sentence, uh, as opposed to having to relate the tenth word in the sentence to some wrapped up hidden state of all the previous words. Um, and then it also helps that you know these links are very general, um, and that these links are uh, fully connected. As in, you can connect the tenth word to the first, second, third, fourth, and so on. You connect the third word just as, just as easily to the First, second, tenth, and so on. Um, or or two thousand word, right? I mean, it's recall. exactly yeah. Or two thousand words. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's that's crazy amount of context. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's important to have links that are learned over time. Um, so yeah, so I guess in 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 the dendrites case, I think I was just trying to make an analogy here. Um, there, it, it also works as a, uh, at least in temporal memory, it'd work in, you just sort of have the previous uh, state to work off of. Um, the other sort of major difference is that um, uh, the important to have links would be sparse instead of this sort of very fully connected um, uh, situation. Uh, you would have sort of maybe sparse connectivity to, to other uh, sort of uh, states and contexts that you'd want to uh, establish links between. Um, so it's just a very general mechanism um, and very powerful in the sense that it's fully connected. Um, let's see here. I guess there is a sort of a caveat of having this to work, which I'll talk about in a little bit, which is essentially that it's so general that you need a lot of data, um, which is that part of the thing that I was saying, it's sort of the usual story of just sort of make it bigger. Um, so I'll get to that in like a little bit, but just kind of going into the, um, uh, the papers that, um, uh, that sort of originally motivated going into this topic. So someone came along and said, well, it worked really well for NLP, and so can it work well for vision? And I don't want to say go super deep into the, to the details of these papers, because I think if the basic idea of self-attention is, is grasped, um, then it's sort of, you can kind of see how it can apply to vision. But there are sort of two ways that it's done. One is uh, local attention, um, and that's in this paper, and this other one is uh, global attention. So I'll sort of just describe what that means. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, so local attention was in standalone self-attention. Um, and then the global is in the image is worth 16 by 16 words. So for local, you're effectively um, treating each pixel as a word and then doing self-attention within um, uh, between pixels um, within a patch. And then for global attention, you're treating each pack, patch of pixels uh, as a word. And so for local, you're, you'd effectively have to move from patch to patch, very similar uh, in the way that you would do uh, for, for comm filter. Um, whereas in global, you can effectively do uh, the whole image uh, all at once. Um, Wouldn't this happen naturally up a hierarchy? 
like in the lowest levels of the hierarchy, you'd be on the left hand side, and on the highest levels of the hierarchy, you would be more like the right hand side. Uh, yes, that is true. I think one thing that they pointed out in uh, in the global attention paper is that you get to create links between pixels, but like this pixel now gets to have a link between this one much earlier in the hierarchy. Um, so that is sort of one one difference, but um, sort of like how soon you can actually relate um, information on one side of the image to the other side of the image. Um, uh, but you would think that at some point you would have sort of global coverage uh, of the image. Yeah. At some point uh, in the in the feed forward neural network. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what you said was correct, but at the same time, there's the downside to that too on the global one, if I understand it right, you couldn't do low level features very easily. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't relate the mouth of the puppy to the eyes of the puppy. You know, yeah, that's an example. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, they didn't, there wasn't a paper that tried. Um, another two big differences between these two things is just the amount of data that they use. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so they didn't actually try. I can't really give like a sort of apples and apples comparison between these two. Um, but you make a good point. Um, one thing that they mentioned in, the, in this paper, because they use, um, they basically take the resident architecture and they just sort of swap, swap in self attention layers just to replace the comp layers and just make sure the, you know, the sizing is maintained and whatnot. Um, uh, the input size and the output size uh, among each layers and, um, and such. But um, what was I going to say? They mentioned that most likely there is a sort of better architecture that they could actually use to apply local attention. So they didn't really try to take their local attention and sort of sort of make it the best that they could. They just wanted to see does it doesn't work better than a comp layer. Um, or as this paper just said, you know, what if we just sort of run away with self-attention and and sort of entirely forget about uh, any architecture that we knew previously and sort of um, see what happens. So they actually take transformer layers and, and use it sort of directly out of the box. Um, once again, just treating a patch of, uh, you know, a patch of pixels, 16 by 16 pixels um, as a single word. Um, this also has the benefit, by the way, that there are already optimized uh, GPU kernels to do, um, you know, self-attention in this way. Uh, whereas this one, um, to do it pixel by pixel and sort of moving across the image um, it's, uh, just as of right now, there isn't, um, sort of optimized GPU kernels for this. So this is sort of another motivation of the 16 by 16 words. Um, do you know, uh, which one IGPT uses? Say it again. Do you know which version I, IGPT uses? Do you know IGPT papers? Oh, I don't know about IGPT. Okay. I didn't look into that. What is IGPT? That's image GPT. That's just from the same people who made GPT, but applied to images. Oh, I see. Okay, this, both of these papers are out of a Google group, and so um, they—I uh, don't think they're related to that work. But I'm—I'm I'm, I'm just curious if it's using the local or the global version, or some sort of mix between the two. I can check later. Okay. Um, so yeah, these are just the general results. So for local attention, once again, they're just performing to their ResNet baseline, just replacing, uh, replacing up the comp layers. Um, so using the same amount of data, um, they end up using fewer flops because they the way how attention works is you can share your weights. You don't have to use as many and you can uh, use, uh, you can do it in, in uh, fewer flops and you can also do it in fewer parameters. Um, so now for global attention, um, once again, uh, they replaced entirely the whole the whole network with just transformer layers. Um, it outperforms the ResNet baseline, um, which I guess is just a ResNet with a similar number of parameters. Is that right? Really similar number of parameters. Um, or I should say, um, apples to apples in terms of the ResNet baseline of using the same number of flops, they outperform ResNet. Um, but generally, for a given amount of accuracy, they can achieve that accuracy in fewer flops. But there's this huge, huge caveat, which is that it's like trained, pre-trained on this, on this. I, I call it modest 300 million images. 
Um, <laughs> that's a, is, is that a joke? I mean, calling that modest? That seems like incredible. <laughs> That is a joke, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it's called dry wit. Well, you know, it, it doesn't have to be. I don't, I don't know. Maybe these days, like, you know, like, uh, you know, GPT-3 is, is trained on, like, you know, the entire corpus of everything anyone's ever written in the world. So maybe maybe 300 million is, is, is modest, but you were joking. Okay, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It, the is the, uh, what, one interesting thing here is the pre-training uh, completely unsupervised because they're using kind of the transformer architecture to predict the next patch, I guess? I think it's weakly supervised, um, but I don't remember. Well, exactly. so it would be self-supervised, right? Uh, you know, how are they How are they training it? With transformers, you, you would, you know, you would fill in a word at a time and predict the next word. Here, is it filling in one okay. patch at a time and predicting the next patch? I think it's like, um, I think they basically have, they, they put in one patch at a time, but then they also include a um, like a uh, an input um, that's it's supposed to be similar to like a start token or something like that, and it goes through the transformer and then in that place of that start token it outputs some representation and then it'll do classification on that output. It's something like that. Um, but, right, but but for the but for the pre training, presumably they don't have labels on this three hundred million images. So I, I, I believe it's autoregressive. So the image GPT, what they do is autoregressive training, just like the words. They just yeah. hide, hide and try to predict the patch they, they hide. So. Yeah, that's what, uh, that would be kind of the natural way. If they're literally using the identical transformer architecture, yeah. that's what you'd have to do. Um, and there's some, probably some fixed raster order that they're going in. Hmm. But I, maybe they don't even, I mean, in the image case, you don't need the raster order, right? I mean, you can have if you're not thinking about saccades and all, you can just mask anything and try to predict the rest. It's not like a sentence where you have an order. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I see. Well, they do. Um, they do give uh, like the inputs. They do augment the inputs with um, some location information, very similar to the way how they do it in in the NLP case of some vector that represents. Uh, where in the image that you are. Oh, yeah, that's right. They do have to explicitly encode the location. Yeah, And they do that for the image. For both local attention and global attention, both of them had their own flavor of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see here. So, uh, so yeah, so apples to apples, self attention, equipped networks uh, outperform the comnets. Um, so I say here, this is possibly due to these, or let's see here. Um, ba, ba, ba. Um, so it does just, there's, I guess there's like a small caveat here, which I won't necessarily, I guess, maybe get into, but um, I say this is possibly due to, you know, content-based uh, interactions, or no, this is, I think, uh, this is how they sort of refer to it in the paper, that you can actually sort of like, uh, sort of create um, you know, associations between pixels or association um, between uh, patches. Um, and then the other thing here that you sort of see is that um, in, at least for the global attention, you sort of have more data uh, leading to um, a higher performance. Um, so there's something here, which is that, I guess you basically have two trends at play, which is that you sort of uh, change the inductive biases of, of your network. Um, and then you sort of make more and more uh, general models. Um, but these general models sort of have to be supported with larger and larger um, amounts of data. So, uh, da, da, da. oh, I say this, we sort of know that this has to end, end at some point in terms of just throwing more data at it and just sort of making the models more general. So uh, uh, Michael Angel, just, uh, isn't those two things uh, opposite? Like, uh, I agree they have a general model, so you can even learn convolution through the, uh, that attention model, but that means you have a worse inductive bias at the start, right? Because uh, convolution, you already have a better inductive bias that uh, was. Yeah, make a good point, yeah. You, you came up for studying how, how vision works and all, and then you, you probably need well, less data if you have a better inductive bias. But in this case, I understand it's a more general method that learn anything. And if it were just uh, a lot of data, it, it's going to learn a better inductive bias through training. 
but at the start, it has a worse inductive bias. That's is my understanding. Hmm. Yeah, you make a I good think point. that yeah, I think the words better or worse are a little loaded there. It, it's there's because it's more general. It's a weaker bias. Yeah. Um, which not necessarily worse. It's just uh, uh, it's, it's making less assumptions. And because there's less of it's a because it's a weaker bias. You need you have to have more data in order to learn. Um, yes. Right. The stronger the bias is, the less data you need. Uh, but if your bias isn't exactly right, then it's not the network's not going to be work as well. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, it is, I guess, a different kind of inductive bias. Is that at least agreeable to say? Well, if it's more, if so, if I understood you correctly, Lucas. You're saying um, convnets are a subset of attention networks. Yeah, and I think they show yeah. that in the paper, even formally, that convnets are a subset of it. Yeah, yeah. So then, um, so in that sense, it's more general. Yeah, and it doesn't mean it's the best inductive bias there is, but you can assume that it's at least better than the very, very general flexible version. But you could get to a better one if you use attention. You just need more training time. I know that's just my perception. I don't yeah. see it. And 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 a fully connected just fully connected networks, huge fully connected networks would be even a weaker bias, yeah. um, you know, would be less bias and presumably would need more data. Yeah. So mm. somewhere in between. Mm. Um, yeah. um, I think that sort of, I guess, leads well into the, to this point. So uh, one video that I watch on uh, it's this YouTube channel that I, I mentioned down here describing this, uh, that global attention paper applied to vision. Um, sort of, I guess, gives this um, kind of general sort of uh, this point, um, which is that, uh, so sure, the more general it is, um, the better it can perform, but there'll be a trade off. You sort of need uh, enough data to actually, um, to actually get you there. And so I guess that's probably a better, a better interpretation of sort of what's happening here versus the better inductive biases, as you guys say. Mm -hmm. Here we made the inductive biases more general, but then we were able to support it um, with uh, more data. Um, although actually, let's see here. But, yeah, that's like a general truism in machine learning. Yeah. What would you say? Uh, how does it also work out if, if? Uh, if the self-attention layers did, so for ResNet, when you displace out the comp layers with with uh, with um, with self-attention, and then use the same amount of data, uh, and you even use fewer parameters, then you actually get better results. So I think there so is maybe some... that one. Yeah, maybe that one is not a superset of combinants. I don't know. Um, it doesn't even have to be necessarily made a superset of combinants, but I think there may be something slightly in in the architecture as well that it is just somewhat like the inductive bias may be slightly better than a regular comb, uh, mm -hmm. just a regular comb layer. Um, so, um, and not only that, but then if you sort of scale it up and make it uh, even more general and then add, add, uh, add in more data, then obviously, well, we always know we get improvements this way, but there is something to say that it is, something slightly of a better inductive bias in a comp, but. Um, yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah it's, it's actually fewer parameters than. Yeah. That's interesting, yeah. Um, so getting back to this point, uh, I guess this kind of made me think about uh, our work and this sort of brings it to the last slide. Um, so it has very powerful inductive biases, um, um, but these inductive biases are, if I, the way how, one way um, you can maybe think about it is um, they're sort of giving you more bang for your buck. So in this case, the brain, you could say, just is heavily constrained by its size and energy constraints. And then it's um, really using these inductive biases to sort of learn efficiently from the data that, um, that it is given and from sort of the amount of uh, sort of energy that it, it, can, um, uh, it can use. Um, so it sort of makes me wonder that sort of like what kind of constraints, I guess, hardware may be given. And then i um, wondering sort of how much you can kind of get uh, out of your bang for buck um, 
uh, using sort of fewer inductive biases. If you sort of are enabled to just sort of throw more power at it and throw more data at it, um, then I sort of wonder what kind of uh, potential trade-offs, I guess, that you can make while still making a good amount of progress. Um, if anything, just to give one possible answer to this, this may sort of give a bit of um, validation, I guess, to sort of the kind of uh, current work that we're doing, which is just seeing how far we can get in injecting the thousand brains theory into machine learning, um, where maybe not a lot of the subtleties, um, uh, you know, the brain can sort of be properly uh, incorporated into it. Um, and maybe some of that stuff will have to sort of be kind of uh, sort of uh, just sort of give way to sort of general um, neural network mechanisms. Um, but nonetheless, uh, just sort of um, nonetheless, we'd sort of still be injecting powerful inductive biases, but even with more data. Um, I'm still trying to make sense of this idea. So, so, so taking on, on your, your line about, you know, this has to end somewhere, was there any sense in these studies that uh, there was any kind of saturation results that, you know, once they went to 100 million images and then went to 200 million images that fewer things changed? I'm, I'm just wondering if they had any notion that they were approaching a fundamentally limiting set of inductive biases for understanding images of the world. Or is it uh, it's just, they're still in the upward slope as, as long as we give it more images, the thing just gets better and better. They were, they had a, these graphs where as, as long as you give it more images, um, more pre-training time than the better and better uh, it was getting, yeah. Um, okay, so we haven't reached saturation yet as far as uh, a representation, at least with, within this framework. Yeah, yeah, at least within that framework, yeah. Um, that would be the hope at some point, right? I mean, that there would be a sufficiency. Um, there would at least be efficiency? What do you mean by that? Yeah. Sufficiency. Oh, sufficiency. As in sort of like a, a saturation point where you don't really, um, uh, where even though you throw more data at it, it just doesn't do any better. Is that what you're saying? More or less, or that it, it, it does uh, equally well. I'm, I'm just, you know, just using humans as, as, a, as a kind of drop-in point. At some point, you understand enough about the world that it doesn't, uh, your processing of images does, can stop at some level. Your higher order cognitive of how do you interpret some of the things might keep on going, but it's like the world is not going to present you with too many new surprises as far as, uh, you know, your expectations, your biases for how the image, how the world looks you know, saturates, I would think at some point. Well, well it has to. I mean, it, it, unless you assume the world is not static. So these, are, these systems assume the world is static, right? They're, they're not learning in real time or online. Um, and then at some point you have a network with so many parameters, you can't, you can't get better and better infinitely long-term. It just can't, it's impossible, right? So it has to, at some point you can reach the maximum you, you can, and then that's that. But whether you're close to it or not is, is unknown, but it seems there's a logic that you can't go on forever. Well, it's, you know, in, in it's whether the, 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 the human visual system, whether it has inherent limits, like uh, uh, Michelangelo was implying that it, 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 at some point, you know, uh, the brain can only do so much or whether uh, it's good enough in that there's, well, I'm, there's I'm not taking enough novelty that. in the world to actually- I'm, I'm, I'm taking out that. humans because I don't think human brains work like this at all. So, but if you just look at these networks and they're of a constrained size, um, they can't, and you're assuming the world is static, it's not changing on you over time, then they can't get better infinitely. They, just, they have to saturate at some point in time. That's the way it is, right? There's only so many parameters and that's that. You can't go beyond the best. So. What, 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 what do you assume humans don't operate that way? I don't think this, 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 this can, the way these things are working here, this, this kind of attention is completely different than the kind of attention that we know that humans do and the whole structure of knowledge based and reference frames. This is how, you know, I'm certain that's how brains work. And none of that's in here. So um, this well, is I would, just. I, I, I was this, being more extract than that. I, I was just the idea that there's inductive biases in how you process things. 
I was just making a comment. If I have a, a, have a network of any type, I don't care what it is or how it's trained. If it's got a fixed number of units and, and parameters, um, you can't continually improve its performance forever. That's just not possible unless the world is not static. Then you can always sort of update to the latest model of the world, but just, just basic, you can't improve something infinitely, right? <laughs> you can't keep adjusting the weights to get better and better at some point, but that's it, you reach the saturation. That's, that's my only comment. I have yeah, no idea. Various. Go uh, ahead, Marcus. Sure. One one very simple rebuttal to this, not necessarily. Well, I'll just I'll just state it. One very simple rebuttal is uh, this this argument assumes that um, gradient descent can discover all of the brain's algorithms. Uh, but if that's not true, if if um, if gradient descent can't discover the important intelligence algorithm, um, then then just you know throwing more data and more computation at it isn't going to help. Uh, so, so like th this argument you're making is is good if gradient descent is able to discover solutions, but it's not. But but, 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 but why does why does it matter? It, it's basic. I'm making an argument. It doesn't matter what what learning mechanism you have. You have a network of n number of neurons. It could be a real brain. It doesn't really matter if the world is static, uh, meaning it's not changing, and you have a fixed number of parameters. Uh, then there is, it's. It, it doesn't matter what it's doing, it can't go on forever. It can't get better forever. It just, what does that mean to get better forever? I don't see how that could, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't matter what, what learning algorithms you have or anything, it's just, there's a limit. You just imagine I was, you got- I, I was with, responding to this specific slide, this specific slide saying that like, do you need all of the hard, do you need to go in and understand all of Cortex's built-in uh, biases uh, or it, can you can you not know some of those and just learn them? Uh, oh, I was, I, I was, okay. I was, I was going slide. back to the, I wasn't even talking about this slide. I was going back to the, the point earlier about. Right, yeah, uh, I, I was, I was, I was talking to Michelangelo when I said you, not you, Jeff. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. So this, the second point, and uh, as a response to Marcus as well, that's exactly the question that meta learning is trying to answer. And I'm not talking about memo, and I mean, memo is just a very, very small part of meta learning, but meta learning is about learning everything, the architecture, um, the optimization algorithm, everything we use in deep learning. And, the, and you can frame it as uh, you want to learn the inductive biases. And there is kind of a two approaches in meta learning. So I've, I've went through the meta learning workshop and it was, was really good, but I could say there was clearly a divide between the community and half of the community was thinking about learning a good inductive biases through meta learning, and then getting those inductive biases and incorporating them into the network. And that's essentially what efficient net, for example, is. That's the state of the art uh, network we have right now that was learned through a uh, network architecture search by Google. And even Swish, the activation function we, we talk about, was also learned uh, using program search. So this is one way of approaching. And the other way of approaching is, is thinking that we don't need to learn the inductive biases at all. We can just make it uh, a very high level optimization process that goes through like levels. And then you can just learn the whole thing, but you don't need to get the inductive bias out of it. You're just gonna make it so that you always learn the whole thing at once. And it doesn't have to be true great and descent. So meta learning is a lot of things you can do. Uh, you can use evolutionary algorithms. You can use uh, all sorts of optimization process like program search. It doesn't have to be great and descent. Yeah, and uh, I'm, yeah, I think that's a very good workshop. If we have some time, we should go to it. And it, it answers your second question. I mean, that's what they're trying to do. There is this uh, work by uh, Tom Kirsch. He is a PhD student with um, Schmidhuber. And he has this work called General Meta Learning, which is exactly trying to learn the whole thing at once, like even the architecture, the, the learning rate, everything. And he's trying to abstract all the way up. So you don't need any inductive bias at all. It just the issue is that we are at the point now where we don't have the computation to do any of that. But what about in 10 years? Maybe we will have the computation to do all of that. And then yeah, it seems like a super, I mean, scaling <coughs> would seems to be really hard. I mean, imagine meta learning something like GPT-3, um, you know, each 
inner loop would be an entire GPT-3 trading pass. Yeah, yeah. Like now, uh, today it's impossible, right? Yeah. Uh, but even in 10 years, it seems like, I mean, they're sort of replicating evolution in some sense at yeah. a very high level, right? Um, maybe through gradient descent, but it's still kind of learning the structure. But it, it seems, in, you know, I can imagine it for smaller things, but even in 10 years, can it scale to just learning everything, meta-learning everything. Um, seems really hard. What do you, I wouldn't say everything. I'm not sure what that means. What do you mean meta-learning everything? Yeah, for, for They're basically replicating evolution <laughs> to learn the structure of the network that will work well on tasks. I mean like they, just, just, it will learn everything we've talked about type of stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, but you think that's really possible? But that's what I'm, that's my question. Well, it's, I mean, clearly evolution did it. So it's, it's possible. Yeah, but, but isn't there an assumption here that we're taking these sort of regular networks and training them and, um, and seeing how far we could go where evolution didn't do that. Evolution created a whole compile, compilation of different types of networks that were working together. Yeah, so if, well, they're doing that too. It, well, it, there's something called network architecture search. I'm sort of lumping that in with this general category of stuff. So you would start with very, you learn the rules by which neurons operate. You learn the structure of the neurons, the network. You learn the learning rules that it operates by. I mean, you learn just take, take, some, take something like, you know, the various rhythms. So we understand now how theta rhythms are essential for doing path integration and learning reference frames and so on. I, I mean, it seems to me that these networks aren't even capable of, uh, capable of learning that. Um, it's like, it's, it's not baked into the, 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 the overall, it's just not part of, I mean, it's hard to imagine. Yeah, if some evolutionary algorithm could discover that because obviously it discovered us, but isn't yeah, there some that, sort of built in, there's some built in assumptions here about what the network's going to look like and what neurons are going to look like and what synapses are going to look like. And um, well, those in are the not meta learning case, they're trying to r remove all of those assumptions basically and try to basically replicate evolution. Maybe I don't understand it well enough, but it just seems impossible to do that given there, there's assumptions about what the networks look like. Um, you know, I mean, they don't start with a blank slate and say, let this thing evolve for a billion years and figure out, you know, they start with some sort of assumption about what the neural networks look like, and then they see, can that neural network learn to do all these things? Is that, am I incorrect about that? They're reducing those assumptions. They're relaxing those. Uh, so it basically becomes learning code uh, at some point. And, and it could learn theta rhythms and it could learn, uh, um, all the different that, types of neurons that we have in the brain. Is that what that's you're saying? Their, that's their argument, yeah. Gosh, it seems, it, even if that were true, it seems like that would be the absolute slowest way to go about building systems yeah. like this. Yeah, that's my point. <laughs> that's my point. Like you can't, how could you possibly scale this? <laughs> yeah. You know, to everything. Yeah, well, well, I was, I, go ahead. But I, just to what Lucas offered to do, I would be interested if, because uh, he brought up this point that uh, uh, meta learning doesn't have to uh, proceed from assuming gradient descent. If you have a taxonomy of things that uh, would substitute for gradient descent, uh, or you have that in mind, or you, you encounter that, that would make for an interesting talk as to what alternatives there are to gradient descent that fit within the meta learning environment. You know, how rich is that? Yeah, there is a, a very good review that was just released. Um, I forgot the name of the author that covers meta learning as a whole, like the whole field. And so gradient descent is just a small part of it. And it shows a lot of other work using other techniques. And I think the biggest techniques other than gradient descent is of course uh, evolutionary algorithms and program-based search where you're searching the space of functions. And then it's more like using abstract reasoning and you don't have uh, gradients to do that so yeah. no evolutionary algorithms you know like evolution evolution like biological evolution works at the genetic level and and so through genes you can create all different types of cells you can create all different types of networks you can create all different types of chemicals and interactions and you know it's it, so you're evolving at that sort of real basic level that almost anything can come out of it or at least there's some very large large universal things that can come out of true biological evolution because it's working at this Sort of protein gene level, but if you if you start with an assumption about what neurons are like or what the types of you know connections between neurons are like, then um, then then you've limited yourself. 
an evolution an evolutionary algorithm applied to a you know a complex standard neural network it's, it's just not going to be able to get to the complexities of a brain what it does because you're doing the evolution at the parameter level or you're doing the evolution at the you know basically at the parameter level maybe yeah so they're removing those assumptions they're removing their assumptions of what and how a neuron operates and, then, and then, even then what, what the learning they, rules are so but how i guess i'm, I'm ignorant then i'm sorry <laughs> i don't understand how every time i've seen evolutionary algorithms applied which is a you know a good candidate substitute right um it's been applied at that level not at the, the more fundamental level of uh, you know, like, okay, we're going to start with biochemical. You know, they, they, they don't have to start with a point neuron. The, the genetic algorithms that were like, you know, started out in the eighties, basically it was just a string of bits that coded for something coded for use of a function coded, you know, and basically used, you know, the typical biological mechanism of recombination uh, random selection and things along those lines, but but the elements of those things, how those, if you want to call them networks, they're they're not they didn't necessarily have to be neuronal networks. There were functional networks that you know inputs come in, something comes out type of thing. Very general. You can constrain it, you know, to try to get interesting results. Like some of the ones used to have the elements of the networks were uh, 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 electrical components, you know, like yeah. just you know, resistor, capacitor, inductor and try to drive it to an evolution for a, a particular type of filter. Yeah. So, so yeah, in that I'm aware sense, of that, but yeah, I, I guess I agree. I understand Kevin. I just still think it's, it just seems like crazily. Uh, it, it, it's not going to, it's not going to help. It's not going to help you understand how the brain works. It would, it would evolve to something very different. But it's it's they're they're just trying to approach it. I think yeah, from, I, I from guess get, level. Th this gets at the you know the basic theme of at least my life and the, the theme of you know Nementa in some sense is that a belief that the you you won't get there uh, unless you first understand how the brain does this stuff. And I, I understand that most machine learning people don't want to do it that way. They want to come up with uh, principled mathematical approaches that they can understand um, that you know, moves them along some trajectory uh, towards uh, a useful solution, even if it's not the solution that the brain implements. I just, I, I've never ever found a compelling argument that that's gonna work. And I'm still skeptical of it, I guess. And well, you can think of it as a sandbox. If, if you have, if you have hypothesized, I mean, or not hypothesized, but drawn from neuro, uh, uh, anatomy literature, what you think the useful parts of of a neural neuronal structure is not not a point neuron, but you know with dendrites, axons, whatever. You know you're you're free to take these evolutionary algorithms and and give those broader you know or looser constraints and say what can you assemble from that? I, I and, understand. I understand that. I, I just the the process is, is very fraught with problems. Even just what problems you're trying to solve. Like, you know, is vision looking at images? No, vision's not looking at images at all. Vision is what happens when you walk around and, and you're moving through the world and looking at different things in different directions constantly several times a second. None of it just captured in any of the sort of benchmarks that people use in vision, computer vision. Um, and so even there's just so many ways you can go wrong in this process that I just felt like even that insight, which is such a simple insight that vision is not looking at images. There's nothing like it. You know, we have a phobia. We've got these hugely distorted, you know, you know, uh, weird stuff going on that's constantly changing, going to your brain, and somehow you end up with this uh, perception you're seeing an image, but it's not. Um, so even that, it, even that, it's just built in from the beginning. And so I feel like th that's an insight that comes from brains. We're studying the animals. That's what animal vision is like. It's like this complex, dynamic thing as you move around the world, and nothing at all like processing images. Um, so you can, it's just it, so many things that you could just miss if you just think, okay, I'm gonna apply some evolution algorithms. Well, I think it's an interesting debate. You know, we'll see, right? We'll see how it turns out. I just, I'm just pointing out that as long as I've thought about this, I've never been convinced that you can engineer your way there, even through evolutionary type algorithms. Um, it just don't, I, I don't believe it's the case. I think the far quicker way to get there is to first understand the principles about how the brain works. And then once you understand those principles, you're gonna you have ways of implementing or maybe even applying evolutionary algorithms to them. I gave the examples of theta rhythms and um, you know, the oscillations and so on. 
uh, you know, it just seems so hard for, for people looking at like computer vision image recognition that they can figure that stuff out because it's none of it's going to be important in that path that they've given it. I am, I'm just giving my bias here. But with this, with this slide, Michelangelo kind of took like a big step back and brought us on the topic of like inductive biases and can you just do, do these big uh, evolutionary searches and stuff. Uh, stepping back forward to just like the transformer specifically and attention like this. Uh, one, one reminder, we've talked about this before. I just want to make sure the, the idea is fresh in your mind that, um, that what they call attention, we might call something else and then suddenly make it seem almost biologically plausible. Like, like they call it attention, but if you think of it as more of like a thalamic routing uh, at the, and successive stages of the visual hierarchy, for example, might add more context using the thalamus to route different inputs and again, yeah. more context. Like we wouldn't that. call that attention. I just, I just wanted to remind you that the, yeah, I, I understand there's, that. there's a clever I, algorithm here that yeah, might yeah. be biologically and, and I think it's, I think this might be really great for image recognition, right? I just don't think it's vision and um, it's not really vision. So uh, when I think about this, I'm, I'm sort of going forward to like what real machine intelligence is gonna be like. It's not gonna be image classification. If that's what we wanna do is image recognition, image classification, then Great, I think these things could be wonderful. I just, uh, I'm just not, I'm less interested in that than trying to understand what real vision is. And so- well, how, how, how would you describe what you call real vision? Are you talking I about- just, I just, I went through it a moment ago. Un, no, no, image understanding? Is no, that sufficient? No, no, it's not images at all. There are no images coming into the brain. You have highly distorted foveal uh, points in the world and you're scanning it around constantly as you're moving your body. And so you're looking at the world, different parts of the world, as you're moving around constantly, up different orientations. And so it's nothing about image recognition. It's about learning a model of the world. I, I, I didn't say I, I didn't say recognition. That, that well, it's nothing really about limits image. it. It's nothing about image. Well, I, there's no that's image an process. That's an abstraction. Brain. Okay. It's in other words, you get a sensorial input, and then you're trying to understand, if you wish you know, what did it mean to you? How do you react to it? A variety of other things. So, so I, I guess, I guess, you know, the thousand brain series says you get this, this very complex motor driven, it's motor driven, it's not presented to you. Almost everything changing in your visual system is because you move and multiple different ways. You get this very complex motor driven signal. And from that, you have to learn a model of the world. It's not to correct, it's not to build a correct output. It's just to build a model of the world. And and I, it just processing images doesn't get you that. It just doesn't even come close to it. Um, well, well, building you know, a model is what I would consider to be image understanding. Uh, now you can't build a model by looking at images. You have to move through the world to, to understand the world. Well, it, it, yeah, I understand I, that to learn it, but then to react to it afterwards, you know. Well, you all right, so moving. mostly what we do is we, we don't generally look at images anytime. We can, we can take, I've always felt that you, the, the, the idea that, oh, yes, a human can look at an image and tell you what's in it. Therefore, let's solve that problem. That's a, a, a small subset and a misleading subset of what vision is. So it's like saying, yes, we have this complex model of the world, which we can now use to do flash image recognition or even attended image recognition. But, but that's not what vision is. Vision is a highly motor driven model building process, which is you're looking at everything in the world from different points of view and so on. So uh, yeah, the, the real vision, you want me to call it real, real biological vision has the ability to look at images, but, that is, but that's a subset of what, a very, very small set of what vision is and what, how it's useful in a, an intelligent agent like a human. Uh, so we, don't, I, we just don't want to get hung up on that process. It's like, that's not the goal of vision, uh, to do those things. Jeff, I think you like my next talk. And what's your next talk? On the it, it's it's a nice environment that maybe we can use, but uh, after after this. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Did, do I know about your next talk, or is this? Uh, no, no. I think you like it. I said. <laughs> but what is are it? You gonna, I mean, Lucas, are you going to talk right now? Uh, after Michael, I don't think Michael Angelo. Yeah. Right. Okay. Are you done, Michael Angelo? Uh, I just wanted to say, I guess, just one thing because we kind of like, uh, I guess, went went in a good amount of directions just here. But um, when I made this slide, I didn't necessarily think about um sort of uh like sweeping all the uh inductive biases of the brain or all the you know sort of the subtleties of the brain under the rug and just sort of you know throw it through some meta-learning algorithm and, and expect it to pop out 
I was more either sort of thinking more that um, uh, that possibly general mechanisms could just potentially temporarily replace um, just sort of subcomponents that we may just not understand enough about at the present time. Um, and still we could potentially make a good amount of progress like with that. So for instance, and I don't know if this is a great example, but um, this is the best that I have right now. For instance, let's say we wanted to sort of, um, you know, tackle uh, more head on reference frames uh, and then and using them in machine learning. Um, and we were, uh, you know, modeling objects, um, uh, you know, in an Alice centric reference frame. And we were taking uh, motor input and we had a lot of the same components that we expect, um, you know, the, the brain to be doing. And, and sort of, we sort of start with as close as we can to what we know what there should be. Um, but let's say there's sort of details with grid cells that were not entirely worked out. And so we use a neural network to learn path integration. A lot of the other kind of components and sort of, you know, kind of connectivity and what things we'd expect to be making associations between one another and, and things like that. Um, all the sort of big principles that we know are true are there. Um, but it's just kind of interesting that we do have these sort of general purpose learning algorithms that we can kind of at least substitute even temporarily for the things that we may still be developing. Um, so that's- Yeah, I, I, I think that that's right. And in and, and some sense, that's what we did with, with sparsity, right? We're applying yeah. sparsity in a way that's really not in, in a networks that aren't biological networks at all. But, and so we're some sense, oh, here's a piece of our theory. And, um, and then, uh, you know, that's only a piece. And then we're gonna do the same thing with dendrites and, you know, and, uh, and with reference frames and so on. But I guess maybe there's two ways to look at this. I'm constantly thinking about what is the ultimate form of machine intelligence, not what's gonna be useful a year or two years or even three years from now. Uh, and so when I'm, like, when I'm, when I'm expressing my grievances or my, my biases about this, I'm thinking like, okay, where do we have to go completely in the end? Um, and I'm not arguing what we should do in the next year. <laughs> I'm just pointing out like this, these, the, what I'm hearing is I still think there's gonna be, you're not gonna get there, but we still have to finish our work. We still have to finish how the brain really represents spaces and how it really does transforms. And we have to figure all this stuff out is my argument ultimately. We don't have to do it right now, I guess, you know? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And I. Yeah. Yeah, I do see the value in keeping the end goal in mind. I think I also like the idea of just, um, uh, maybe, maybe this is just from like age, I don't know, I, I have a harder time thinking in like, you know, like longer term, uh, or at least um, more rather I should say, kind of like a, uh, like an eagerness, I guess, just to sort of see good results in the short term. Um, so for me, it's kind of nice to think about sort of how much we potentially can get done with w what we do know now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I understand that, but that's, you know, that's how people felt about machine learning techniques over the decades. Um, and, you know, maybe, you know, definitely my attitude is an outlier. There's no question about it that, you know, like, Hey, you have to understand how the brain did it first. A lot of people don't want to do that for maybe it take, takes too long. Maybe they just find it too hard to think about brains and biology. Um, there's, you know, maybe it's like you said, Hey, I want to get results I can get now, but um, I just, you know, so I've taken a longer term view and think, yeah, but you could get stuck. You're going to get stuck. Um, and therefore, I mean, you have to do the hardest stuff. <laughs> so that's my, that's my bias. That's the whole, that's what Nemento is all about. And that's, you know, what I've been trying to do. All right. Uh, enough said about that, I think. Um, maybe unless I don't want to talk more about it. I want to make sure if, if Michelangelo is going to, or, or, or Lucas, you're going to talk next. Is that what you said? Yeah. I, I just want to make a correction. I said, I said don't curse before it's a Louis Kirsch, uh, the work on general meta learning, and I send the link on the chat. He has an architecture that can learn back propagation. But yeah, this is a small correction. Yeah. Uh, I do have a talk. Are we done, Michael? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. All right. Yeah, th thanks, Michelangelo. Yeah, that was good, Michael. That was helpful. Thank you. Uh, let me see. That was also a much simpler description of attention than I've seen. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's nice. Okay, yeah. Hopefully it was a uh, reasonably understandable, um, but uh, I kind of like the, the analogy, but. Just a minute. Right. 
So I'm going to assume you can see my slides. We can. That, that's not going to work because I, I need to share it with you as well. What, uh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> we, we did see your slides. Yeah, but I, I, it's better if I share my entire screen because otherwise it can't show. Uh, let me show. Okay. So, uh, so on the conference, I was um, on the lookout for um, environments and benchmarks as well, because that's something I've been thinking about, especially because of what Jeff said that, you know, uh, what we want is uh, to build the model of, of a world through uh, sensory motor behavior, not just by static image. So one thing that I came across, which I found it's really cool, uh, it's this environment. So I'm going to divide it into two parts. One it's the environment and the other is the benchmark. And it doesn't mean we have to use the benchmark. We can just use the environment if we want. So Interactive Gibson is was built to be an image net for robotics. So as a context, it, it's a collaboration between Sanford and Google. And it's from Fei-Fei Li's group. So Fei-Fei Li was, has been working on data sets for a long time and most some of the most popular data sets are from her group, including ImageNet. And uh, what she's working now is she wants to do an ImageNet for robotics. That's what she thinks it's missing in order for the field to, to come together and, uh, and, and just move forward. So what Interactive Gibson is, is they're photorealistic simulators. So they're built from actual uh, photos. And what's different from currently state um, state-of-the-art simulators is that it includes physical interactions with objects and it's allowed and it's encouraged. So usually photorealistic simulators, you can move around, but if you bump on a chair, the chair won't move. So in this case, they, they built it. So it's it's an actual, um, yeah, so the ob you can interact with the objects. There is a, it's physics based. And what you can do is you can train and evaluate robotic agents that use uh, visual signals to solve navigation manipulation tasks, like opening doors, picking up, uh, picking up or placing objects, searching cabinets, it's just moving to some place, and they encourage use from all disciplines in robotics, uh, planning, learning, control, et cetera. So let me just understand, the, the, this is the key point I want to understand here. Yeah. They're using the visual input to do all these things. Uh, there's no uh, somatosensory component of this? Uh, yeah, uh, not, not just, not just, and I'm going to get there. So okay, you can use all sorts of inputs if you want. You can just use vision input, but um, the environment is going to provide all sorts of data, like the location of the, the, the robot, even others like depth sensors and other things. And you can either choose to use it or not. This is just what the environment provides. And I think it's easier if I just kind of show it. Okay, sorry. So... So these are our, our scenes, which are built from actual homes, you know, they're, they're built from photos. And so the agent can uh, navigate through the environment. You can, you, you can randomize some, some things like colors or, or object <laughs> placements, visual texture, dynamics. It's like- be, It would be weird if I was walking through the house and everything changed as I walked through it, you know? Yeah, I mean, that, this, this, <laughs> well, it's not, it's not changing as you I walk know, through it. I know, I know. These are just different I know, options. I know. I'm yeah. just saying it's funny to watch it. <laughs> so you can uh, interact with uh, articulated objects, like to, you can see the arm has, uh, has joints and all, and it's moving the, the desks. They have more than 500 object models. They have this uh, articulated arms with us. There is a multi-agent support, but I don't think we're really worrying about this now. Well, yeah. okay, never mind. Uh, one, one thing so I want. So they start with a they start with real images, and then they they make a model of it, like a computer. Yeah, model. they start with real images, and that's what I was uh, getting at. Uh -huh. Go uh -huh. back. So they start with real images, and then they build this model. And what they are doing now is to bring interactive into a static model. So it's all deep learning based. They do a 3D reconstruction match uh, doing semantic segmentation. And then they identify which objects there are, right? They do instant segmentation and then they go. Uh, so they have these proposals of where, which objects are where, and they use Amazon Mechanical Turk. So actual humans go and review and, you know, just confirm, okay, that there is a couch there, the chairs there, just to make sure it's correct. 
And when they, when they have this data annotated, like here's a chair, here's a table, they use a, a physics-based environment, they use a bullet which is open source to enable interaction. So this, so from an actual photo, they go to a, a environment that allows for interaction. So I could like, for example, turn over the coffee table. Yeah, exactly. So you can turn over the coffee table. And, and since it, it's built from photos, it's easy to transfer back to actual environments. So do seem to real. So you can transfer back to real robots since it's it's built from an actual environment. So I could take a picture of your yeah. house and go yeah. through all this process and I could interact with your house uh, in the simulator. So after I build a simulator, then I could in theory make it run in the real thing. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so it's built for research. It's uh, MIT license. It uses open source bullet for physics simulation. So the entire pipeline is in Python. It's by OpenGL, by Bind, and there's just C++ for the training part for the part we don't actually uh, change. Uh, it supports up to a thousand frames per second and 256 by 256 resolution it runs even in common computers. The render image, they go direct to tensors and GPUs, and that's important for us. It's a, a, we don't have to download it to host memory and then transfer to uh, PyTorch. Why do, you, why do you think a thousand frames per second? That seems excessive to me. Yeah, that also seems <laughs> excessive to me, but I mean, I'm just highlighting well, if training. If you're training uh, a system on this, this could be- uh, if, you're, if, they're, if they're thinking they're training a, a, a convolution neural network, then they have to have millions of yeah, images. <laughs> You have to train That's millions and millions of images. Clearly, humans are not capable of doing that. Um, <laughs> so, okay, got it. It yeah, will certainly slow things down too, right? You know, but I guess that's the point of the training. But I mean, you can choose. You don't need a thousand frames per second. Okay. They're just highlighting what what it can do. And so, in terms of agents and inputs, so they have like a few agents available. Ones like the Mujo humanoid. And then the end, they have four wheel navigation agents like the robot. Um, supposed to be an arm here, two mobile manipulators with an arm. There is a legged robot and a quadrocopter. So you can choose what agent you want to use. <laughs> and some of the inputs, so you have visual signals that includes like image, but you can also have as input like semantic segmentation, depth mats, and Aside from that, you can have information about their own configuration, like where they are in the floor plan, velocity, collisions with environments and objects, motion, and information about navigation tests, like position of the goal, uh, closest waypoints. So all this information is available. It doesn't mean you have to use in the test. Mm -hmm. And some of even something like the last point there was is a pre-computed shortest path to goal, so that you can have that. Yeah, you can have that. As you don't have to figure that out. Yeah, no, yeah, if you want, right? It depends. Yeah, so right. I got it. I meant to define whatever task you want. So if yeah. you want to define a task that you only use an image to like try yeah. and solve the task, you can do that. So just, just a parenthetical question. Uh, so the name of the project, is that a reference to William uh, Gibson? It is, yeah. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and actually, so there is a previous project called Gibson, which is from 2018. And the difference between Gibson and I Gibson, it's the interaction. So Gibson didn't have this. And so you, you, you could see the, the environment, you could navigate to it, but you couldn't like flip a table. You, if you walk to the chair, the chair uh, wouldn't move. But that's, that's why it's the I, uh, interactive Gibson. Okay. Sorry, uh, who's William Gibson? I don't know who that is. Uh, author of Neuromancer. Uh, basically oh, that's a, a sci-fi sci -fi person. Well, yeah, but particularly oh. VR and- uh, okay. uh, Okay. Isn't there a reference to that Gibson? Isn't there a Gibson in psychology? I think that's uh, he has some work on I think perception. I think that Gibson's <laughs> is the reference. Okay, well, could 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 be. I just uh, I just got okay. the reference from the author. Yeah, I think right. it's uh, James Gibson. Not that. Oh, really. oh James. <laughs> yeah, I'm not entirely sure, but it's a, it's a psychologist, not. Hey, hey, Lucas, is there a specific task associated with this or a set of tasks that that's, I didn't quite get that. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm going to get there. So I, okay. Yeah, so I wanted to break down into two things because when it's the environment, so this environment supports all sort of tasks. You can define any task you want, right? And, uh, and they encourage use from all disciplines. And the idea here is they give you the environment and then people from like planning are going to define a, a, a planning task. People from learning are going to define a learning task and et cetera. But and just to close this, they're working on more semantically guided interactions, for example, like turning on the stove. 
uh, actuation of articulated objects. Like we have an arm and the arm has a few joints, but you know, it's not as realistic as it could be. Is that, is that the robot or is that objects in the world like a safer rock moving or the- Both, know? both. Both objects and, and the, the agent itself, right? Uh, yeah, they I think it's a good example. Because the, the way they've broken it down are two separate things. The, the world you're interacting with has objects in it. Right. And they can, be, and that's, a, and if they're articulated, which, you know, they have behaviors, that applies to everything. But then the other side, if you're trying to do an articulated robotic arm, they're sort of leaving that out of the picture here, right? That's like, that's up to you to figure out how to do that. So that's not something that's part of the, the data set, right? It's, it's, that's part of your implementation of your solution, I would think. Yeah, but it's up, uh, it's how you define the agents as well, right? You can define an agent with three joints in the arm, like, and or you can define with, I don't know. But is that part of Gibson, interact with Gibson, or is that just part of my, my solution that's how I'm gonna solve some okay. problem? That, that's part of, the, that's the uh, degrees of freedom you have on the agent, right? So you have like- uh, Yeah, I understand that, but is that part of iGibson or is that just whatever, you know? Are they specifying that? Like we were in a set of, a set of tasks that involved a, uh, a one-armed, three joint robot or is that is that not part of uh, Gibson? So they have the agents available and when you define a task, you choose, you can choose the agent that's going to play the okay. task. Okay. Right? So you, you're going to choose an agent, let's say you choose the Mujoku human agent. And, the, and that agent has uh, a set of uh, degrees of freedom that you can use it to manipulate uh, the agent, right? So yeah. uh, you know, one you, of the things that struck me right away, but I mean, I think this is wonderful by the way. Um, one of the things that struck me right away is, you know, when we interact with the world, it's so much of what we do is through somatosensory interactions. It, it, you're just not even aware of it. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm going, I'm going to open the fridge. I may take a quick glance at the fridge, and then I, I'm looking somewhere else as I reach out and grab the door of the refrigerator. I, I'm not even looking at it when I grab it, and, and I know, and I, and, and by touch, I know where my hand is and how I adjust it to get there. So I don't have to look at the the door, the, the handle, and the refrigerator when I'm opening. I only have to like locate it once, and then I'm gone. And so it's so much of what we do like that. Imagine like putting on a T-shirt, right? It's it's in a pile in front of you, this pile of clothing. I can put on a T-shirt in the middle of the night. I do this all the time. I can just feel with my hands, and I feel where the collar is and the, where the seam is, and just do this stuff automatically. And and you can manipulate this really complex folded piece of fabric and get it over your head in the correct direction without ever seeing it. So this, there's this blurring between what we do with vision and what we do with tactile sensation. So I always feel like you really can't, you're going to be limited in this world if, if, if your robot is relying completely on vision to solve every problem uh, without sort of a true somatosensory system. It's not, it's not a criticism of this. It's just pointing, I'm just making that observation. So I was wondering if they, how much are they specifying the somatosensory part of this? It sounds like yeah. there's certain robots that have certain things, but you know, do they even have tactile senses other than maybe, you know, Well, they, they have some data, like they have collisions with environments and objects. So that means, I mean, if I touch a chair, that's going to be part of my input data if I want to see that. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's going to be very far away from the kind of some other sensory inputs yeah. that we have. But I think it's, it's a process. I mean, it's a start. And, and yeah. I think this is probably going to evolve into something. No, like I think it's great. Again, I think it's great, although it, it does need to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it becomes you know you know you see these uh, you know sock folding robots or whatever they are you know they take ten minutes to fold the sock you know because like, yeah. <laughs> they're constantly it's like you know like, it's like you're doing it with a set of you know like joysticks and you're looking at it in a box you know and trying to control some arm with a set of joysticks that's what the robot's doing without a not a sensory system um, yeah it's really hard not, not, not a criticism I think it's great but mm -hmm. so, I love this. Yeah, so um, the normal questions on this is to get to the tasks, so the benchmark and, and the task they define. So this is not associated with the environment. So I think what they're proposing is two different things. And this is one task, one benchmark they propose as something that I Gibson could do. So they propose this benchmark because it's a convex combination of path and effort efficient scores. And, and here's a combination. And a path efficient is, so you define a goal, like the agent has to get across the room like one meter uh, apart. It has to get to the other side of the room and it's a cluttered environment. There are like chairs in the middle and tables and et cetera. And uh, the metric is a combination of path efficiency. So how efficient the path uh, taken by the agents, how efficient is the path taken by the agents to achieve its goal? 
sorry, typo. And uh, effort efficient, that's how, um, uh, this is poorly written, but uh, <laughs> path, path is, I copied from the paper, but it's poorly written. You're, you're being efficient, you're getting rid of those spaces, you know, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so path, path is whether you are getting there to your objective or not, if you're taking the shortest path. And after effort is if you're hitting something in, in the way, like if you're spending any effort, like I have to move a table, I have to move a chair. So it's a combination of both and you can define, you know, this, this alpha parameters, so how much you wanna optimize for path, you just want the shortest path or how much you wanna optimize for efe efficiency means I don't wanna bump into anything. And they have this uh, open leaderboard where they test several like enforcement learning agents for this test. And uh, like DDPG, PPO, uh, SAC. So these are like state-of-the-art enforcement learning agents. And here's how they define alpha. So if al alpha is zero, uh, it's going all the way to effort efficient. Like I don't want to bump into anything. So I want the solution where I go like around the room and get there. And if alpha is one, I don't care about bumping and having to move chairs. I just want the shortest path. So I want this straight line, even if I have to move everything aside. And there's like a somewhere in between. So this is a task they define to test this uh, environment. And one nice thing that we kind of discuss about that is usually in reinforcement learning, there is no division between training and evaluation scenes. And in this case, that's something they thought about. And since you have this option of randomizing, you can actually do that. So you have this distinction between training and evaluation. So you don't actually see uh, during test time, you don't actually see the same data you saw during training, which I think for reinforcement learning, it's a huge step. You're saying like, I, I, I may be learning the, the model of the rooms in one place, now I'm in a different place and I have to understand it from a different position, that kind of thing? Exactly. That's how the evaluation is done in this test. Yeah. Okay. So you're learning like five, six rooms, and then I'm going to take you to completely different room and then you have not completely different but different room and then it's funny the word scenes bothers me but i don't want to over over emphasize that it's more like uh it's like you know it's, the training shouldn't be a set of scenes the training is a, you know movement through the space right uh it, it, are these systems trained by just showing a bunch of images or it, i assume it's it's a interactive movement no, it, it's interactive so scenes means scene is like the room where the agent's gonna try and navigate. So I give you a room and they, those are all rooms. So I give you a room yeah. and you have to get across that room. So that's what they're calling the scene. And then uh, if I give you a different room, that's gonna be another scene. But the learning is, is like we discussed before, there's an agent and the agent has to navigate through that. Yeah, it's funny, I would, it, it's kind of weird because the way I think about brainstorming this, it wouldn't be like that. And if I show me a different room, I very quickly build a model of it. I don't. I don't necessarily generalize from the previous room. I just thought, <laughs> oh, this is a new room. I see what it is. I built the model a bit very, very quickly, as opposed to having to go through, you know, a lot of training. Um, you know, like I can, I can navigate in a new house I've never been in before very, very quickly. I may not know where the rooms are, but any particular thing I've seen in the room, I can navigate it very, very fast. I don't have to like stare at it for a while. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but this distinction doesn't mean that during evaluation you can't learn. Uh, it means like you have access to previous training scenes, so you could learn. I I got it. I got it. It just, it just shows a bias in the thinking about it. Um, I, I, I don't want to over, it just shows a bias in the thinking about what the solution might be like. Um, it doesn't say you have to do it that way. Yeah, I could be learning during the evaluation. Um, yeah, so I would, I would argue that there really shouldn't be two different things. <laughs> um, you should, um, that it's continuous, but, but that, that's all right. I'm just pointing out how yeah. to think about this. Yeah, so uh, yeah, this is what I have. It's basically uh, showing this environment and- uh, So it's been released? Is it all out there now? Yeah, it's all out there and uh, it's all Python. It seems like easy to integrate with uh, PyTorch, whatever we have now. So mm. if we're looking for like some sensor motor stuff, that's uh, something we can uh, look into. Yeah. So do That's you think um, this is something we can use for to define our own sort of benchmark on top of this? Is that what you're thinking, Lucas? Exactly. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, we can define our task for however we see fit, but we can use this environment in order to define our task so we don't have to build it ourselves. One of the, um, you know, just again, uh, this is not to be critical of this. It's, um, it's just an observation. This sort of navigation task that you know, I'm in this space, I need to figure out how to get someplace efficiently. 
that, in, you know, as far as we know, that's something that we can, it can be handled in the hippocampal complex, right? That's what, you know, grid cells and play cells do. Um, and as we've been talking recently, the, the process of, say, uh, applying that same basic algorithm to manipulating an object like a stapler or a smartphone or something like that, um, it's not it's not exactly the same. We were talking recently about scale and the difference of types of multiple sensors at different orientations and so on. So there is a you might end up with a set of solutions that uh, work very well for just navigating. Like okay, I'm facing this direction. I have one you know I can go forward, um, or you know I can turn and go forward, back up, that kind of stuff. May not generalize to the more uh, to the more general solution of, hey, how does the hand pick up an object? And how does even vision work when I rotate the object in front of me? Um, it may not apply to that. If people may just first settle on the, hey, let's figure out how to get the robot to navigate from point A to point B and not hit things, which is fine. I just want to point out that that's a subset of what I think is going on in the cortex. It's a subset of what's necessary to do the full you know, machine intelligence thing. Um, but it's still a useful thing to do, so. Um, yeah, well, we can think of stuff like, we can, implement stuff like uh, the stapler uh, knowledge, like uh, I want the agent to pick up the stapler and, and learn. Yeah. How well, that's why right. it sounds like they had uh, object behaviors in there, right? That's yeah, they, yeah. You know, so a stapler could be picked up and rotated and opened and pressed down. And that gets, that really gets to an interesting, you know, that gets, that brings in those other uh, problems. Because uh, now I'm looking at it from a distance, it really would help to have the somatic sensory motor part of that. So. Uh, anyway, none of this is to be critical. I'm just sort of uh, openly thinking about it uh, as you're presenting. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, that's uh, it's about ahead. It's a lot of work. <laughs> so to implement this, yeah, I mean, they probably put a lot of people to work on that. Yeah. It seems they're investing a lot. So I think it's, um, it looks I mean, like it's growing. I mean, are, are there people are there people who've implemented stuff on top of this, like uh, people who've actually tried to use it for some tasks? So this was just released, like now at Nerve. So uh, they themselves they defined this task and they implemented with reinforcement learning agents to show the capabilities of the environment. Okay, so, so they've uh, they've done it. They have done it. So right, I showed that table with results there, but um, I think they just released. I don't know if people picked up, but you know, you know, Fafili groups is very. You know, they're, people behind ImageNet, so uh, 